Hi, I'm John Foro at Book Expo America. I'm here with Martin Short, author of... Martin Short, I must say, my life as a humble comedy legend. So this is a memoir. A, yes, sir. An autobiography. Um, is this your first yes. memoir? Uh-huh. Um, why did you decide to write it now, um, at th this point of your career, at this point of your life? Well, you know, I'm 64, so no rush. You know, what are you going to do? Uh, you better do it now. But I think that, um, I don't know, I've had a, like an amazing career. And I don't mean that in, like an accomplishment. I mean just in the eclectic nature of it. You know, as someone who's done television and movies and Broadway and, and um, known so many kind of fascinating, funny, interesting people, not just in comedy. And, and so I always thought, yeah, I could write a book, but I never knew what it would be, so I never did. And then a couple years ago, my wife died. We had together, been together almost 40 years. And it dawned on me that, you know, I'd been... Uh, you know, my, I'd lost my parents when I was young, so at 20 I was an orphan, and at 60 I was a widower, and I thought, and in between has been the career that everyone's known, and then I've just continued, um, still, I think, being creative, and still... And it dawned on me that, that, you know, loss can be empowering, and that you, because you gain a little bit of knowledge about what life is, and as I contemplated this with notes as I went through the recovery period, you'd go, oh, I, oh, wait a second, I think that's the book. That's what the book is. Not, I'm not saying that the book is about the cult survivor, but the book it now has this kind of structure of, because even at 20, when I'd lost my parents, you know, you have a choice there. At any time, anyone who loses anything or any tough time, you have a choice. You're either empowered by it and become more knowledgeable about life, or you are damaged and you turn to drugs and drink and everyone says, oh, well, you know, it's understandable, you know, he lost his parents. I remember um, a couple of years ago, um, Stephen Colbert had just hosted the White House Correspondents' Dinner. And George W. Bush had sat three seats down scowling and the audience didn't, took its lead from him and they didn't know uh, what to do. So he kind of not done well in the audience itself. And I had seen it on YouTube and I thought it was, first of all, he's always hysterical, but I thought, well, boy, what a night. And two days later, I was at this party, and there he was. And I'd met him a couple times, and I went up and I said, were you scared? And he said, no, when I was 13, his father and two brothers had been in a plane crash and all died at the same time. And he said, that day I was scared. The rest was, I can handle. And you kind of go, oh, I get it. So that, for the horror of that, empowered him to maybe be Stephen Colbert. So that's, that's a pretty serious place to start uh, for a comedian autobiography. Yeah. Um, and unsurprisingly, the book is very funny. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I really enjoyed the parts uh, about your family, uh, about your early life. Mm -hmm. Did your family have an effect on uh, your choice of career, either intentionally or unintentionally? Or was there something about the environment? I think that people who are nutty kids, like I was, with their own imaginary television show in their attic, and I used to have like a, I actually had a, I was on NBC, but every other Tuesday, is at 14, uh, because that left time for my imaginary film career. So those kind of odd p children, you know, I don't think are created by influence. I mean, my mother was a concert mistress of the symphony, so I knew the word rehearsal from her going to rehearsal, but I don't think that was it. I think that what was great in my family is that all this odd, <laughs> you know, left of center behavior was encouraged and applauded. No one made me feel like I was nuts or a goof or a loser, and that's hugely important. But I think some people are just unstoppable forces. <laughs> <laughs> was it always comedy, or uh, were there other performing arts that you were also interested in? Was comedy something that came later? Well, I grew up in a very funny family. Mm -hmm. So for me, I was the youngest of five, so it was trickle-down comedy, you know. I was just stealing from my brother Michael or my brother Brian or David or my sister Nora. So 
I think that that was the norm. My father was very funny. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of the character, Jiminy Glick, the, the sarcasm, the edge, the, came from my father. So I think that um, it was normal. But in my attic, the Martin Short, you know, attic show, uh, certainly was, you know, was, I sang, I danced, I'd have guests, you know, I had an applause record. Speaking of Jiminy Glick, um, so you're famous for these characters that you invent, Ed Grimley, um, Cohen. Is it Cohen? Irving Cohen. Irving Cohen, thank you. Um, how do you go about uh, building those characters? Is it a process? Um, is it, uh, what are your inspirations? Well, usually the characters that I've done have come from one person or a combination of people because I think if you do that, then it, inherently it has three dimensions. Like a character like Franck from Father of the Bride, if I came out and said, Tolo, plage de mat, and I, I'm winking to the audience and trying to be funny, I don't think it would be funny. But I think the characters come from, there are, our, our, our life is filled with characters. You know, you pick up your shirts, and the guy, I couldn't get a stand on Mr. Short. He's wearing Madras pants and he has a mohawk. And he's not, he looks like a, a character from SNL that would be too broad. Mm-hmm. And yet he's not trying to do anything. He's just selling, you know, cleaning your shirts. And so, but he's sincere. He's sincerely just being that guy. And that's what I learned from doing Second City Stage, that by just not trying to do joke or trying to be funny, but being sincere within a character, and the audience becomes part of your journey, and then they will laugh. Do you have a, um, a, a phase of your career or a group of people that you are fondest? You, you know, I've had, a, I've had a great career when it comes to working with great people. And, you know, I can look back at uh, Second City Stage and working with John Candy and, and Eugene Levy and, and, and Catherine O'Hara and Andrea Martin and... In my first show, my, the very first show I, I did, I was still in university, but I got cast in a production of, of Godspell that ran for a year in Toronto, and that was Gilda Radner and Paul Schaefer and Victor Garber and Andrea and Eugene. And um, I had never met, I knew Eugene, but I'd never met Gilda or anyone like that. And, and that was her first show. And so then from there, and Second City, and then SCTV, and then Saturday Night Live, I, you know, you just... You, you get to work with great, great people and they stay with you and you steal from them and you get inspired by them. All those people that you mentioned, I think, are Canadians. Is nah, that... Gilda from Detroit. Okay. Uh, but what... from Portland, Maine. What is it? Well, that's almost... Yeah, I know. Um, what is it about? Is there something about Canadians that is, you know, lends itself to uh, s- sketch comedy? Is... I think that... In, I think there was, you know... If, if you looked at Second City in Toronto and Second City in Chicago, uh, if you went to Chicago, you'd see a show that was maybe more political, mm-hmm. probably smarter writing, you know. Mm-hmm. And then you'd go to Toronto and you'd see Catherine O'Hara and Robin Duke playing two female trunkers who are drinking and driving all night, and you were laughing harder. So I think the, the, the Canadians did, were prone more toward character Work because there are more characters in Canada. And also our influences. We got American television, we had Canadian television, and we got British television. I mean, we got, we saw the Pythons before it was shown in the States. So I think a lot of influence. And I also think the country uh, is a very open country. You know, issues that tear this country apart weren't and have never been as big in the Canada. Gays in the military passed on page seven once, you know. Mm-hmm. Healthcare since '62, no Second Amendment. Um, so that that unusual behavior is kind of what else is new? It's not uh, as odd. Do you have a one moment in in your career which is like, what was the biggest meltdown you ever experienced on stage? On stage? Yes. I never had a meltdown on stage. Not ever. No. You know, I never been really defined by the admiration of strangers. Mm-hmm. You know, if someone didn't like me, I'd think, oh, how about I don't like you? So <laughs> we have a good deal going. I mean, I'd learn from it. If you bomb two nights in a row, there's a good chance your material sucks. 
But I wouldn't, I never went through a phase where I'd look in the mirror and say, I am not worthy. I would think, okay, whatever. My friends like me. Just move on. Move on. Yeah. So the book is out November 4th. Yes. And the title is, I must say. The title is Martin Short, I must say. My life is a humble comedy legend. Gee, I hope people like it. Thanks for taking the time. Pleasure.